Hello, everyone. Welcome to this roundtable uh, working with enterprises, how startups can win corporate customer. During this session, we will discuss some of the challenges startups are facing when trying to connect uh, with enterprises. We will also hear some of the tips and advices from Catalyst Ventures and Oracle for Startups team. I'm Liz Masakovice. I will be your host for this roundtable. And I'm also Oracle for Startups ambassador. This role allows me to be in touch with uh, many different kinds of startups in order to discuss their future plans. I will not you reveal a huge secret by saying that business is all about making connections. During these conversations with startups, there is this one single question that leaves no one indifferent. Would you be interested in being connected with enterprise? What's so special about startups and enterprise relationships? We will dig deeper into this topic today, but before I go there, let me do some housekeeping by providing you with practical information of this roundtable. Uh, so the length of roundtable will be one hour, and uh, this nice virtual format allows us to be closer to each other. So in case if you would like to add some comment or ask question to our speakers, feel free to do so by using a chat option on the right part of the screen. I will keep an eye on it. And now meet our speakers. Uh, our uh, first speaker is uh, uh, Matis Brunaus. He is uh, CEO of um, Squad Robotics, and Matis is planning to robotize the world. Exactly right. Matis, uh, would you like to introduce with yourself and tell a little bit more about your company and what you are doing? Sure, sure. Um, my name is Matis. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Squad Robotics. Um, in essence, what we do is we build uh, software for industrial cleaning machines. And uh, just to make it simpler to understand, think of an industrial cleaning machine as a much larger Roomba that you have in your house, but just for industrial spaces. Or the other way to look at it, it's the machine that uh, you see in the shopping malls cleaning the floors. Uh, well, we automate that. Uh, but we build software for that. We are not the ones who build hardware. That is done by our corporate partners, so the manufacturers. We're the ones who are building the software. Um, I know that I have to say uh, about my stage of the startup, and this is one of the most exciting times uh, there is. Uh, we are currently in, uh, in process of uh, closing our investment round, and one of the dependencies of closing this term sheet into investment round, invest, investment agreement is we have to sign our new deal with our corporate partners. So um, the topic is as relevant as for our company as possible. Congratulations, I'm happy to hear this. Thanks. So, and then our next speaker, Rain Spunde is CEO of Catalico and also entrepreneur with more than 25 years of experience in international trade and market expansion. Uh, Reynis, please introduce yes. yourself. Hi. Yes, my name is Reynis. Uh, I am the CEO of Catalico. And um, yeah, in, uh, in Catalico, we are, uh, we are changing the tire and rubber industry towards sustainability. Uh, not fully, but uh, still <laughs> as much as we can in terms of the consumption of uh, zinc oxide in this um, for this application and uh, we are also currently uh, in a fundraising stage uh, to raise our seed fund and uh, our target is to start sales by the end of this year so cooperation and deals with uh, industrial partners uh, is an uh, important topic, topic right now. Uh, then 
We have also here Roman Lobos, who is a business education leader from Catalyst Ventures. Roman, I'm happy to see you here today. Please introduce with yourself. Thank you, Lesma. Pleasure to be here. And uh, looking at the panel, I'm sure that uh, whoever's listening, they will get some useful tips and some very cool information. So I'm excited for you all as well. Uh, but uh, about myself, in short, uh, I work with Catalysta Ventures. We are a hybrid startup accelerator and private equity fund. We support startups, yet also we support corporates. So we kind of act like a bridge between the two, between these two powerful forces. And uh, anyhow, we like to call ourselves, ourselves connectors because uh, uh, we facilitate introductions and then relationships between our corporate partners and the startups we support, which results often in very successful business relationships. So I'm excited to, to be here and to share some of that experience and to learn something new for myself. Thank you, Roman. I'm also very happy to see Gabriel Dimovsky, who is CEO of Doxy Chain. And Gabriel is listed as Forbes 25 under 25. Congratulations, Gabriel, about this. Thank and you so please, much. the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, yeah, my name is Gabriel Demovsky. I'm CEO and co-founder of Doxy Chain. We are a B2B SaaS company. And we manifest that we are the one who transform document management space for better, for better place. Um, and for this purpose, we are built solution on the Tyler blockchain technology. Um, yeah, we are two years uh, startups and uh, like my colleagues, we are joining uh, investment round. Uh, it, this is, it will be our second investment round, seed round. Um, and we would like to build a new startup, a new standard for document management at the European market. And uh, once again, thanks, thank you for having me here. I'm super happy to participate in this uh, interesting conversation. Indeed, I'm really looking forward, especially because we have here Lars Westergaard, who leads Market Connect uh, in Oracle for Startups program. And Lars has this very special talent uh, of looking at uh, businesses from different perspective and providing amazing suggestions. Lars, please introduce with yourself. Thank you very much. So Lars Vestergaard is my name. I'm Danish. I'm based in uh, Copenhagen, so not terribly far away. And like Roman from Catalysta Ventures, I have a role that for the startups that work onto Oracle Cloud, I'm part of what we call Market Connect. I literally help connect the startups into that corporate side, whether it is the system integrators, the channel partners, or the end customers themselves. So Roman and I are very pleased to be able to be part of a discussion today to listen to what some of the startups have already done for the sake of winning corporate business. Uh, we are learning every day. So uh, great to also be with such a, a very senior set of uh, startups here today. And also we have here Max Donhill who is EMEA Business Development Lead at Oracle for Startups. Uh, Max is passionate about technologies uh, and he is also passionate about sport because he is Ironman triathlete. Thank you, Liesma, and super grateful to be here today. And I am the first point of contact for customers and our cloud because working with the enterprise, it's I would describe it almost as a former founder, like a, like a dance. There's leading and following. And when we lead startups to our customers, we, we want them to follow us on our, on our cloud journey. And we think that when it comes to introducing our customers to startups and on our cloud, that all stand to benefit. And I'm, I'm that first of point of contact for our cloud to get up and running and continue this journey of that last feeds on Market Connect. Thank you all for uh, excellent introductions of yourself. So net, now let's uh, dive into this topic. And I would like to start with Matis by asking, um, who are you selling to currently and how does it go? What are the challenges? Um, thanks, uh, thanks for the question. Um, 
we are selling to uh, cleaning machine manufacturers. So the guys who actually build the machines that are being operated. Us as uh, software providers, uh, especially when we are focusing on something that involves hardware, uh, makes it extremely important to have partners um, because otherwise we would have to figure out a whole another set of problems which comes uh, with manufacturing. Uh, and since us being a uh, software company, uh, it's much easier to uh, deal with these type of uh, things if we have partners in terms of manufacturers. So um, in essence, what we who we sell to are the guys uh, in Europe uh, currently who are manufacturing these machines and we're selling them uh, a product uh, program to get them to uh, providing autonomous machines in their product portfolio. Um, if you're talking about challenges, um, the last two days I've been actually in conversations with my customers. So uh, we are in currently in the in the in the process of negotiating a new deal. So uh, an expansion of our previous deal, uh, which uh, basically runs longer and and is more uh, in depth and 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 talks about more uh, more business cooperation. So with these business talks and with more complexity in the in the conversations. It also leads to uh, different aspects that comes out, like different problems and different uh, circumstances. And if I have to summarize, it all comes down to it all comes down to de-risking their decision to say yes. And uh, you know, they have their own internal processes, they have their uh, technical teams, they have their business teams that they have to align all the interests uh, of. Uh, of themselves and how do we fit into their uh, interest um, and into their decisions and um, of course you know working with corporates uh, length of, uh, of decision making is the typical thing uh, because we're working with um, the top level of those companies I'm, I'm you know I'm talking with the owner of, uh, of, uh, of the company and the head of uh, head of engineering so it means that they have their own agendas you have to think about their personal things that they want to uh, that they want to achieve with you know working with outside partners, uh, but also it means that if you want to um, really nail down uh, the deal, you have to provide something that they need, and uh, it's all about finding this specific thing that they are interested in, and uh, you know it's it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of work back and forth. At, testing and, and validating your hypothesis that you think that you they need and then actually talking with them and understanding what is their concerns and those not necessarily match we think that we have something really cool in the tech side our discussions comes down to IP it's a completely different thing which you uh, cannot know until you talk with them and then it's once you hear those concerns it's all about how you address those things if you are good with the things that you present you're good but it's at the end of the day, it's about addressing the concerns. Yes. Uh, what is your experience in selling to corporates? Yes, uh, I have to say that Matis said everything uh, very correct, and I can only agree on, on, on that one. Um, we are still pre-revenue so we don't yet sell to anyone but uh, we are going to sell to manufacturers of rubber products and tires and also to manufacturers of uh, chemical adsorbents and catalysts so that's basically chemical industry and um, and here, uh, for us, one of the most challenges is that uh, these industries are very conservative. It's actually all big, uh, big players are conservative, but I guess maybe chemical industry is even more conservative as others. So, and, um, and they request uh, a lot of um, commercial references and proof uh, before they even start to consider uh, you as a potential supplier. So it is difficult and um, you need to be creative to, to, get, uh, to get in there. Yeah, but um, but uh, if you have, um, yeah, we need to have a, 
um, a good value proposition to the to the industry. And uh, if we have uh, um, if we have this uh, value proposition and we have been able to validate it uh, that it really works uh, for some specific um, applications then uh, there is a reason to believe that um, you may be successful and at least uh, this uh, can give you uh, some further arguments or further topics uh, what to discuss with uh, corporate partners and uh, yeah main thing is to keep the discussion going indeed Gabriel, I know you have experience uh, in working and selling to enterprises and you have your lessons learned and your challenges that you have won. Yeah, so uh, we have a, a huge opportunity thanks to COVID pandemic situation that the document management uh, system exchanging document in a digital way uh, was growing and we actually have a lot of different clients uh, we have a small and medium enterprises we have a legal themes notary um even public sector who are interested in our solution they are using our solution but as my colleague says um having uh, uh having enterprises clients last much more longer and uh, even though uh, we bring them a great usp because uh Having a blockchain technology digitalize your document with a blockchain technology with you give you um, fully compliance with the new European standards, how the documents from the huge enterprises to smaller cl clients should be protected and submit. And we give them a ready solution for, for this pain for European standards. Uh, it's still a um, huge challenge uh, to find a first mover because all uh, tell something about the blockchain but still there is no enterprises who are uh, rapidly uh, happy to implement this and position themselves in the first mover so uh, we have really benefits that uh, the institutional player and regulation going in uh, our direction for our solution nevertheless there is uh, still this uh, challenge they are uh, not 100 percent convinced to use this uh, solution once it's on top of a blockchain and second biggest challenge which uh, i can see as a, a part of the document management system that there is already well established company it means uh, the competitors it's huge i can manifest and underline the benefits of having a blockchain technology how the the security the transparency of the system can look like but there are some existing solution like uh, for example docusign and a lot of companies already use this solution and they see that the document management is all about electronic signature we see that thanks to smart contract it can be much more stronger make your uh, contract really smart and working for you not only make them static they are electronic signature but it costs us a lot of times and efforts um, so from my perspective uh, even though the market is growing and asking uh, uh, for, for this solution, there is still obstacle and challenge of be a first mover. And second, about the, the competitors is really strong, uh, but we know our USP and we know how to compete and convince them. Thank you, Gabriel. So we have three startups with different uh, products and uh, kind of different and similar experience uh, with challenges working uh, with enterprises. Roman, uh, hearing uh, these stories, uh, do you have any comments or uh, would you like to add something to what you just heard? Brilliant examples and, and really challenges that point out what's, what's the problem for many startups in this uh, relationship between corporates and startups. From our perspective, uh, we see also that as maybe some of you already mentioned that uh, it's really difficult to get this anchor customer actually to get the first one that would uh, set the standard and would become this uh, promoter of your idea and of your business. And uh, once you get that, it might be a little bit easier. But then again, the sales cycle with corporates is so long, it's, it could be over 12 months. And do you have enough resilience and funding to, to weather this 12 months before you get the first paycheck? So uh, not paycheck, but this uh, invoice, right? 
so yeah, many many different challenges startups face, and uh, I think that having the solutions to them and learning from others could be a game changer. So uh, organizing such conferences and having these discussions, it could be it could be very helpful to these startups that are facing very similar challenges, and they could they could learn from uh, from founders here like Gabriel and. Uh, Rainus and uh, Matis and actually figured out maybe in an easier way. So so yeah, learning from each other that's the that's the way that's the way. Thank you, Roman. Lars, I believe uh, you also have uh, thoughts going in your head hearing these stories. I do. I was actually earlier today with a startup that told me they went to eight different teams within a very large corporate ended up selling nothing because of COVID in the end. And one of the big things we discussed there was, how can that be revisited? When COVID is over, how can you revisit an entity, a corporate that you know so well, you've met eight different departments. Maybe they sent you from one to the other to kind of get rid of you. So it's also very time consuming. And that startup, they literally said, we wasted six months on, on this particular endeavor. So I'll continue working with them on trying to get them back. And my very big advice is set up some KPIs because they actually ended up doing a POC for one of those eight different departments, but they still ended up going nowhere. And they had not set up some KPIs or key performance indicators. If our solution gives you value A, B, and C, then you commit to buy or something. So uh, that was a bit of a story as well as advice right there to make it tangible when you work into those to try to get around the challenges that enterprise give you. Thank you, Lars. Max, something to add from your side about the challenges part? Absolutely. I, I would actually add three things. Uh, and those would be from a, a cloud perspective, at least sovereignty, disaster recovery and security. And so when startups look to target large corporates, especially in Europe, it's, it's really important from a cloud perspective to keep in mind questions of, of data sovereignty, more and more relevant in this day of the Cloud Act. And for example, making sure that specific workloads for specific customers are hosted in specific regions. So for example, German customers in a Frankfurt data center is important from uh, sovereignty perspective and then from a disaster recovery perspective it's it's so important once a customer perhaps that first customer is online and then uh, maintaining that relationship with uh, as little downtime as possible so having an architecture that encourages uh, backups and uh, uh, failovers should, uh, heaven forbid, one specific server go down is really important. And thirdly, from a security perspective, if we look at what happened recently in the context of the solar winds attack in America, supply side breaches are a real concern nowadays. And, and it's, it's startups and early stage businesses and that uh, can find themselves actually the target of quite sophisticated attacks if they are selling to large customers because they attackers, it seems, can see these as a an attack vector to then uh, breach the, the networks of, of large enterprises. And so it, security is not something that can be kicked down the road uh, and it needs to be addressed from day one and therefore picking the right cloud provider and putting the right security architecture in place from day one is, is really, really important to win and keep those early customers. Thank you, Max, for providing us with this uh, serious, in the same time, important aspect of, of challenges part. And that leads us uh, with the and next uh, topic, which is about approaches uh, startups have used uh, in order to overcome these challenges uh, that you would like to share with, uh, with our listeners. Gabriel, uh, I would like to ask you first uh, if you would like to share approaches you have used uh, in your experience uh, to overcome those challenges. 
Yeah, so uh, I really like this case which Lars was talking about because I was in the shoes of this uh, startup one year ago once. Uh, we took part in the acceleration program in the Vienna Compensa. Uh, Vienna Compensa is one of the biggest in the C region insurance company. We participated in the acceleration uh, program. We actually took a second place. And let's imagine that we have an opportunity to uh, meet like three times board of directors. And one, uh, like uh, uh, Lars said, said there was only people who pushed to another the obligation to take care about us. So there there was even an initiative to make some kind of uh, collaboration with a startup, but ultimately there was no such a will but, or if, or uh, the execution of, of, of this. So we, we, we started uh, to looking for this coll collaboration, looking for uh, partnership with uh, uh, enterprises clients via acceleration program. But right now I stop it. Uh, I ask my uh, my people to stop even submit a, a paper to the these corporates because I see that I have gained much more via collaboration, for example, with uh, Oracle right now. Once they can uh, connect me with them, and unfortunately for this market in my region uh, and for enterprises, it's highly inefficient way. Uh, even though we try to make some acceleration program but I don't see any successful story for this. Uh, and it's brutal. Uh, I like that there is uh, such an initiative, but it's brutal. It, it doesn't work. And I was the real, uh, uh, it was I, I was really use case. And which I have, uh, if I can give you one recommendation and uh, for startups, if a company will not, uh, they don't like uh, buy your product, don't spend one year to convince them, make them, uh, that they would love solution you that the market uh, will think that this is the standard and that there will be obligation on them to have your solution like with vc if the venture capital says at the very beginning they're not interested don't push energy and effort to convince them that there's a super cool company to be invested make a impression build a market uh, go and focus on another leads and show them that they are they were wrong and they will go to you two years, uh, ne next two years, but don't uh, waste energy for one leads because ultimately in our life, in, in startup uh, life, the time is everything, not even the finance, but the time is everything. And we, sh we should focus to scale up as fast as, as it possible. And it will be not possible to make it happen with people who don't believe in your solution. Gabriel, strong words. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yes, so uh, Rainis, you said you are not yet selling, but uh, you have such an extensive experience uh, in entrepreneurship. Uh, I believe you have some approaches in your pocket that you would like to share with us. Yes, so um, I think that a very important thing is um, for startups, to start to talk with uh, the industry representatives as early as possible. Even, even if you are not uh, kind of convinced about your product or your solution, still uh, you need to start to look for those contacts and to start talking uh, with them because they may guide you in the right direction. You may hear what they are really looking for and that will all, that all helps uh, build this uh, value proposition. And uh, then also in these large companies, uh, you need to take into account not only the interests of the company, but uh, the, the opinions and interests of uh, each individual, because they may have some, some private reasons why not to, why why to push your idea forward or why not to do this so there are there are many aspects and um, you need to need to go to the to some industry exhibitions or fairs to meet with them and to start start to talk and to get to some tests and uh, uh, so that's 
that's already already a good a good success if you if you can get to some tests and uh, also i guess uh, don't take no for an answer but uh, in a reasonable uh, in a reasonable uh, way <laughs> let's say if uh, if somebody does not uh, want to work with you then uh, you should not uh, spend too much time but uh, you you need to you need to understand the reasons for 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 them to saying no and uh, yeah, until you don't know these reasons uh, you should maybe still keep asking uh, questions yeah and um, also uh, during this way don't um, be afraid to change also your product or your offer uh, also also we uh, started with uh, a different idea and uh, when talking with uh, industry we understood that we need to pivot and um, that's also an important uh, important thing be be ready uh, to to hear different opinions and be ready to pivot thank you and um matis i know uh, one thing that uh, resonated in me when i was uh, listening what rain just said i remember you know uh, you have the you have the sound yeah uh yeah, I, I, I resonated a lot with what Rainis said, uh, also what Gabriel said. So uh, Rainis' approach uh, to going to expos and, uh, and getting to meet all the people, that's exactly what we did. I mean, we, we went to our first expo in what, 2018, I think, and we were very early. We didn't have anything in our industry. We just had a thought and, and like some, print, some fringe product that was consin uh, considered similar to in our industry. So. You know, we bo we booked the smallest booth in the sixth hall of Berlin Expo. Uh, all the major guys, our customers, were in the first hall. I we set up the booth, we set out the demo. I went to every single booth of that first hall and the second hall. Invited every single manufacturer to come to our booth to see what we did. You know, he, they saw something running around there, and they got interested. And that's where we worked. We worked and we worked and we worked. And it was not necessarily the right people at the very beginning, but uh, through those conversations, we started to get to the right guys. And then by the time that uh, you know, a couple of months went 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 by, we advanced our technology. We had better things to develop, uh, better things to demo. In the next expo, we brought the right guys to our stand, and that's when I saw like, okay, this is something really. They have shown progress. And they have worked their way to get to us. So that was like a clear message that we are here to stay and we are here to provide something that they need. And uh, at the end of the day, through those two expos, we got our first two customers. But they were not the first two ones that uh, that we approached. They were not. They were actually not the ones that we were nearly close to signing the contract. It was a third manufacturer that we actually were very, very close to sign the contract with at, at the very beginning. Uh, but uh, they chose to go, they decided to ask exclusivity from us. We said no. And we went to, uh, you know, we continued to work with the other ones. Now that we have worked with the other guys for two years, I know what's been going on with the guy who first said no to us when we were really, really close. And now, I, now that I know that basically months or two months from now, I'm going back to him. Because right now we have so much better proposition we have built up our muscles with our first customers. I mean, it's it's a it's a circular thing. You can there's no doors are ever closed, and if you just find the right approaches, yeah, you can get them. Yes, stay flexible and look for uh, solutions. Roman, uh, you just heard some of the approaches uh, startups have used used so far. Uh, would you like to comment? And those were brilliant examples and advice. So uh, I'm, I hope everybody's listening and taking notes. Uh, I actually, I wanted to ask Gabriel, what was the difficulty with this accelerator, with this uh, Vienna, Vienna insurance company? Because my advice was based on 
using your network and using facilitators to actually connect and get this anchor customers. Uh, one of them would be accelerators that have this B2B connection as one of the propositions. And uh, yeah, sometimes they don't work. But again, maybe Gabriel would agree that also when it doesn't work, you kind of learn from it and then you make your product so much better that next time it works. So Yeah, absolutely. Um, just let me clarify. It was a case once, uh, even me, I as a founder, I have no idea how ultimately this product will look like. We have so on-premises uh, smaller POCs, but it was like we, we were looking to uh, together with a company to try to figure out the POCs. And after several hour workshop, we we indeed uh, f uh, found the, this uh, the way we can be real value for this company. But the decision maker uh, after this process ultimately decided to stop it. Still underline stop it, not uh, cancel. Ultimately, our and uh, uh, I don't would like uh, I don't like to interrupt Renis, but uh, this is very important what you said. We should retail, literally be better and better, build a better product. Listen, and with uh, every no, we learn much more with yes because it makes our product, our company stronger. So uh, it was our case. Uh, we we try to figure out together with a company how uh, our USP value could be great for this company. We find it, but ultimately it, there is no uh, will of have a blockchain technology. So we indeed we 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 put on the board our the best resources for this conversation for this for this lead, and we didn't want it. We didn't lo lose it, but still don't make ma money on on this. Uh, and that's why I I just said to respect uh, our time as I start. Right, makes sense. Gabriel, yeah. you you hit it. You hit it well. I mean, uh, the way that we did what uh, you know we. Uh, learn from all the conversations and all those iterations of our, you know, our product, what we were selling to our first guy. Eventually they said no, but we used those lessons because we kind of knew what those issues are. So we used already in, in, in advance, we know that they will come up with when, when we're talking with the other guys. So we already had prepared, uh, prepared uh, much better for those conversations. And the, uh, you know, there's not always there's a match between what you offer and what they need, but it not 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 necessarily means that the other guys don't need. Maybe the other guys need that. So yeah, you have to find this specific connection. Whether uh, what you're doing and what you've learned throughout doing with whom you're selling to. Maybe as a suggestion, also because we are now focusing or nailing down kind of the relationship once you already met, met the corporate. But it would also be interesting to maybe discuss how do you meet them? Because you, I think all of you mentioned that you go to conferences and expos and uh, and you meet the clients there. And when you are brilliant salespeople as Matis, obviously you succeed. But, uh, but there is so many different ways right now to meet these anchor customers or regular corporate customers that uh, maybe startups should explore many of them. Like, as Gabriel said, accelerators, then there is hackathons, two-day event where you develop an MVP, and then, you know, that's a relatively small investment to get to get intros and to get conversations started with massive corporates or with national governmental agencies that help, uh, help national startups to reach their own companies. There is uh, universities that have various, various contracts with uh, companies that kind of introduce early stage startups to, to the corporates. There, then there is companies like mine that uh, kind of help early stage startups, obviously. So if you're interested, hit us a message. And then there is companies like Oracle that facilitate introductions to their own customers. So there is so many ways right now is that that I, I just wanted to say that we should all be open to all these opportunities. And, and if listeners are, they should explore beyond even conferences and beyond uh, beyond LinkedIn connections, they should explore everywhere. Uh, but one thing, Roman, there, uh, what's important is, uh, I think, and at least I know our customers, they are being approached by startups in our industry quite often, but I cannot imagine how many times uh, a company like Oracle is approached by startups with their new idea. And uh, I think very, very important, at least that work for us is building trust. And this trust is only built with time. And this trust, what it means, it means that, first of all, with this trust, you need to showcase that you're here to stay. 
that you're not just uh, flimsy that just tries their idea doesn't work you know you have to show showcase some resilience and some stickiness that you are there to actually be there and and be there for the long haul because corporates are not interested i mean they are in a way to test out the pilot see whether it works or not but if you want to get them as a customer for a longer run you have to establish trust and this is built in you know going out and networking after those things and uh beers don't hurt uh all of those things you have to do in order to build this relationship and and you know that's that's when uh, personal uh, personal likely likeness of the person is also necessary i think that's where the best deals are made aren't they exactly Lars and Max, I see from your eyes, uh, you have uh, comments and uh, ideas on, on this. I'll only add to that. Um, I always say that uh, trust drips in, but leaves in buckets. So trust takes a long time. And if you lose it, you lose it in one go. So you really got to be careful as well. When you talk about, Matt, is how you are evolving your solution. Whenever you target your corporates, you have to be blissfully honest. What level of sophistication is your corporate uh, solution that you can sell to them? What is it at? Is it an alpha? Is it a beta? Is it a theta? Never oversell. Only ever over deliver. And I think a lot of what I can also apply is expectation alignment. So whenever you start to deal with a corporate, it's a little bit back to what I mentioned about setting key performance indicators, but always align expectation. Like we also discussed, how much should you hassle the guy who's going to buy from you? If you feel that you, you need to call him every week, then do it. But if you somehow talk to him and get to a point where you can align expectation that is it okay if I call you every week? Is it okay if I email you and hassle you? So somehow find that level where you can become industrial friends and not just a supplier provider. And part of that trust you build is that you really give the expectation that you're in this for the long run, but that you also offer value. I ever so often advise uh, startups to uh, seed little snippets of information with the people you're about to sell to, let them know that you've got a finger on the pulse on the industry whether it's I found this great news article or I've seen this like-minded in your industry, a corporate that has done this. So somehow you add yourself to that little circle of trust. Max, would you like to add something? I, I think indeed, I, I agree wholeheartedly with uh, what all the panelists have said. And yeah, nothing to add from my side. Yes, uh, indeed, uh, startups sometimes are selling not only solutions to existing problems, but sometimes even solutions to future problems that are most likely to come. And that adds extra complexity to, to this sales process and cycle. Uh, and yeah, uh, we already touched a little bit uh, advices for startups uh, on selling into corporates. I know Roman, Lars and Max has uh, extensive experience uh, watching how startups are doing, holding their hands, helping, uh, being serving as a bridge, as Roman said. Uh, so, yeah. Lars, maybe you would uh, like to start uh, on on and open your bucket of advices. I know you have a large one. I, I would certainly like to bring in the whole issue of channel partners already at this stage. Because let us say that uh, you on your side, Ryan, is you need to go and get your first customer. You probably have to do that as coal canvas attend an, a conference like Mattis did or something like that, you win your first customer. But when you scale, it's impossible for you to think that you need to go yourself and visit all of those. A lot of procurement by those corporates you sell to actually only happens through channel partners. We at Oracle can't even sell to some of our customers because the RFIs, request for information, RFPs, request for proposal, they are issued towards an Accenture, towards a Deloitte, towards any of those large system integrators. 
And if you can fit yourself in there, become part of their turnkey solution, where that system integrator makes money on implementing your solution, they make a little bit of a cut on the software that you typically sell, they then become the one to many, just like we at Oracle can. But that's where an Oracle or any other cloud vendor that has the muscle that we have, there are a few, but definitely not all, can align up with those system integrators and then form a little, uh, again, their circle of trust. That is certainly some advice I will give you. Uh, earlier today, I was with a small healthcare startup that had begun canvassing individual hospitals. And I told them to stop that. You've already won a few of those. Now go for the big regions. Now go for the NGOs if you want to go to emerging markets or Africa and build hospitals there. So really think about how you can optimize the one-to-many approach to uh, minimize you spending too much time on those very large sales cycles in the next century hand that. Max, um, your view, your suggestions. In the end, I think that from a relationships perspective, uh, last the, the one-to-many approach, it also extends to solutions that are perhaps more click and deploy. So, I think for uh, the uh, SaaS space, I think it's also really interesting to look at places like the uh, cloud marketplace that Oracle offers. And that that is another really useful channel that if a solution is uh, click and deploy, then that's a really effective way to have visibility and not have to go customer by customer, but actually have some inbound traffic. And the other interesting thing of listing on a cloud marketplace is that it enables, in the case of Oracle, for example, what I like to call the army as a service of Oracle sales reps that will perhaps not be in the strategic account segment that last works into, that perhaps work into the middle of a company rather than at the top. And yet, still have these customer bases and when a sales rep has an existing customer and is looking for innovative solutions that can drive value for that customer having a listing on a cloud marketplace is a really effective way to enable even more people to get in front of the right people at the right time with your solution and by the way to complement that i always as well advise startups you are so familiar about giving pitches, accelerators, Catalysta, you probably also are running those sessions, learn how to do a, an effective 30 second elevator pitch. But my point is always as well to learn how to ask amazing questions so that before you begin your elevator pitch, you have ascertained if there is a match, what is that person thinking like? So a large part of the training and practice that I would definitely recommend is that you really get yourself familiar with what could a killer set of questions be. Ever so often, you only have 10 seconds. If the guy is walking by you and he says, I'm heading for the keynote, I need to sit there in, in 30 seconds, then you've got to throw him your 10 second elevator pitch. But if not, if there is time, the trust is built if you really ask a super nice and relevant question where you get the person to appreciate that you're giving him or her the time as opposed to begin ranting off the elevator pitch, the blindfolded one that you might have rehearsed to give to a venture capital, to your nephew who needs to know what you do, or to the customer that you are looking at selling to. So with that, I'm also saying, based on the response that you get from a question, you should really adapt and adjust to always hit a tone of relevance. Don't ever attempt to oversell if you feel that what you do is outside of the relevance sphere. To, to pick up on that last, I, I always try and remember the, the five W's and perhaps we're, we're veering more towards the sales 101. Having said that, I think yeah, it's especially relevant to your point, Lars, of the who's, the what, the where, the when, the why, to avoid close-ended questions and really try and get to know the customer and what specific pain points that they might be facing and how your solution can can address those those pain points.
I can I add on that? I believe that there is a very important need to understand not only the customer but also sort of the outside of outside his world. So the surrounding environment that they are working with. So I mean, from my my experience, um, I know quite a lot uh, about the uh, equipment manufacturers and. I dig really deep to understand how the distribution distributors work. What are the pain points of the distributors that are a part of the supply chain, but you know plays an important role for the manufacturers. But me understanding the intricacies of those supply of the distributors allowed me to formulate my questions in a much better uh, way for the manufacturers. So overall intelligence, so of of the all industry of the whole different parts of the supply chain. It always benefits you to structure and suit you, uh, structure your questions and, and tailor them specifically uh, to the needs of the customer. And you know what it else? It, it also showcases your intelligence on the on the topic. Best thing that you can do is tell your customer something about his market that he didn't know. I mean, some of those things. I've. I, it, it has been some very very. Uh, cool moments when uh, when my my the owner of the company he said, "Okay, that's something cool. I didn't know that." Uh, I actually had a case uh, with uh, a, a gentleman I I ran a, a workshop with this morning. He used to be a, a startup accelerator member. It's seven years ago now. He's doing really well with a CRM solution. One of his first customers hires him to be a consultant. He has really won so much trust that his advice and his understanding about CRM is one that is industry leading, cutting edge. So, Mattis, I, I I absolutely hear what you're saying, and and I work with a startup in the UK that works in additive manufacturing, a, a new, very hot topic that is very closely associated with supply chain, like you mentioned. He looks like he's 22, but he's a lot older than that. But when he's with a corporate and they begin to discuss supply chain and he just rolls out the most and broadest industry knowledge from a breadth and a depth point of view. He blows their mind with his understanding and all the acronyms and terms and players in supply chain. All the doors are open once they give him five minutes to talk about that because he has proven to be one that they will continue to talk with. He has knowledge thereafter. There's two ways to get that knowledge. It's one is read read as much as you can and second is talk and there's i mean you read to prepare to talk once you talk you dive deeper because that's when you ask the really relevant questions i think yes so our round table is uh, slowly coming to an end still we have some minutes left uh, if listening all this, uh, someone has uh, something to add or share um, experience from the roundtable, uh, some emotions, please feel free to do so. And while we wait for that, I can't help but also wanting to add that whenever you target someone, I know you can't always do things better, cheaper, faster. You should maybe be lucky if you can do one of those. But if you can make whatever value you can bring as tangible as possible in a discussion, a lot of corporates are after that. They will not buy from you for being a cool tech, being a clean tech, being someone who has something that is really of interest. That is uh, going back to that old, uh, you never get fired from buying Big Blue. That was how you said in the old days, if you in procurement bought IBM, you'd never get fired. Um, but somehow, if you can give something that can always be double underlined, uh, I would recommend that as much as possible, you practice and you rehearse that. I've been with a few startups when they've been challenged ever so often with, so, so how much can I save? If they weave a little bit, well, that depends. Immediately sketch a scenario and sketch how much percent increase, decrease, customer retention or whatever it is. Try to make it as tangible and measurable and underlined as possible. I know it's hard, but that really allows that person to get a little bit closer to that warm, fussy feeling about maybe there's something beyond what that person subjectively thinking maybe there is business value 
that person can benefit from bringing into the corporate they represent. So did we get any questions in the meantime? It seems no, if I do understand this tool correctly, how it works. It, it seems no, but I believe uh, all of us has uh, uh, the same uh, type of rights so we can, uh, we can all check and see. Yeah, it looks that, that we don't have questions from auditory. And yeah, if anyone would like to add something, please do so. Otherwise, uh, we can conclude this uh, roundtable. Another advice for anybody listening, which is just three letters, A, B, C, always be closing. <laughs> Works every time. Indeed. I, had, I actually had a, a, a boss who went for that, uh, and, and I completely agree uh, on that. Uh, what could be the definition of value? And there is a question. On my side, it, it's really about a little bit uh, what was discussed earlier, trying to find out what is going on in your industry and then know what are the key challenges they have and how the value you bring can help reduce uncertainty or reduce cost or increase revenue or something like that. Try to appeal to something that is super relevant, but it's always value. Um, I, I've ever so often also mentioned that I used to be an industry analyst with, with IDC, Gartner Group, IDC, et cetera. I was there for 11 years. And I was used to dealing with corporates like Oracle or Vodafone or someone else. And they all came to me and said, I'm the world's best at, and then they ranted on about who they were. And, and I, I kept telling them, listen, I've got now a very aggressive BS radar. Don't tell me that you're all the world's greatest. Tell me what you bring and what value you bring. And I think it's a little bit that that I'm trying to appeal to, that instead of when you uh, are pitching that you describe who you are and what you do, that you always flip it around to how the value you bring can cause a situation A, B, and C to be easier for the corporate because that immediately gets them into solution mode and saving mode and is how you'll get that a stamp of approval and can win that trust because you have shown that you understand the industry and what challenges they have. To add to yeah, maybe. a little bit, it also depends who exactly you're talking to and what incentives do they have. So the value would really depend, are you talking to their procurement manager or are you talking to the CEO or the board of directors? Because then once you talk to many of them or to a couple, you have to bring value to each particular part of the organization that would support you and wouldn't block your, your idea. At the same time, bring long-term value to the organization. So it becomes a little bit challenging. But, uh, but once you realize their incentives and what they want, you can say, okay, my solution will do this for you, this for you, this for you. Well, you don't tell it like that, but essentially that's the idea that they all see the value for themselves and the organization in your solution. And, and you know what? I have actually, uh, Roman, I've ever so often had those pitch competition sessions and I literally ask the startups to start over again if they don't, ahead of giving their pitch, tell me, who am I? So who, who am I as a listener? So stop, stop. Are you talking to me as procurement? Or are you talking to me as IT? I'm absolutely in full agreement. So being able to adjust that and do it quick and do it elegantly on the fly there is really important because it's all about empathy as well. So it's all about being at the same wavelength. I used to work for a corporate where we took all tests. We took personality tests and we had little Lego blocks with colors on our desks so that when you walked up to a person, you knew what personality were you addressing. And we learned little tricks on how to address a person with that personality differently. It's the very same about who it is you are talking to from a corporate, depending on what value or, or sorry, what uh, purpose they have in the organization because appealing to that gets you so far. Thank you, I gentlemen. I just one very quick. If I can add something, uh, I really like it. I read it one time. And, uh, to make your startup successful, you should position yourself like a vit not like a vitamin, like but like a aspirin, showing that without uh, aspirin, you can uh, 
you can not overcome your headache. And without vitamin, once you got, uh, left your house, you can easily deal with whole day. So build a startup, build a project which can be positioned as a aspirin, not, not as a vitamin and, and sell it. Yeah, if you're a so-called painkiller, then there is no there is no way they wouldn't they wouldn't buy from you. Uh, no, sorry, gentlemen. Thank you. We need to, really to wrap up our roundtable. It's five o'clock already. I really um, appreciate uh, the great energy and spirit uh, during this session from all of you. It was amazing session. And if our dear listeners uh, crave for more, just like I do. Feel free to contact uh, our speakers uh, via social networks uh, or using uh, these participant cards in this textual um, event. We will all be happy to uh, to talk to you and um, thank you for connecting to this um, roundtable. Also, if you are interested to learn more about Oracle for Startups program, just Google Oracle for startups, and that will be your starting point uh, in your journey. Wishing you all a great afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you. Time. Thank you so much. Thanks, Esma. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.